A Total War Saga at Troy poses the question, what if the Trojans invaded the Greeks during the Iliad instead of the other way around? Greetings watchers if you are viewing this on YouTube, listeners if you are accessing the audio version, or readers if you are viewing this as an essay. My name is Tom, and today we are going to be exploring the story of Achilles and the events of the Trojan War through the looking glass of Total War's Troy Installment, a strategy video game set in mythical Greece. If you are familiar with my YouTube channel, you may have seen a few videos on this game crop up here and there, and this will be a spiritual continuation of the latest few episodes where I began a campaign as Achilles, and I will be telling you the story of this and how it compares to Achilles in Homer's historical play, The Iliad. However, for those who haven't seen those videos, I will quickly recap the events of them. Before we dig in though, I would just like to outline how this video, podcast, or essay will work, as I haven't really done any gaming content in a format as long and in-depth as this before. Firstly, this is going to be a bit of a journey, an odyssey if you will. No doubt you can see the timestamp of the media you are consuming, or the scroll bar, and have noticed that it is indeed rather long. I have structured the retelling based around the key trials and tribulations that the character of Achilles went through in my playthrough of the game, including some important info about what some other characters got up to, and the main things that were happening to the world. When I played the game, I used a mod called Radius, which is an overhaul of many of the game's systems, so some of the things that happen in this recount might not happen in a vanilla game, or a game without unofficial add-ons installed. Also, I tried to play accurately to how I believe the characters would have behaved based on their personalities. For example, Achilles is stubborn and prideful, and my fifth year did not worship Ares, Aphrodite, or the other Olympian gods due to the fact that they side with the Trojans in the war. Some light roleplaying, I suppose. The last thing I want to mention before we dive in is that, hopefully, if all goes well and I avoid any major accidents or changes to my life, I will probably make more content like this in the future, also based in history. I started this game as it is the earliest historical game I could find, and the plan is to play through more in a chronological order, starting with the time period surrounding ancient Greece. Anyway, without any further rambling, and that is not a promise, let's begin the story. The story of Achilles and the War of Troy. If you look at modern day Greece, or Hellas as I will be referring to it for the duration of this story on a map, it is sort of laid out like a horseshoe, with Greece proper, as I am referring to it, on the western side, and Anatolia, which is now called Turkey, to the east. The top of the horseshoe hooks over the northern side of the Aegean Sea, which lays between the two and is dotted with small fractures of islands. To the south is the larger island of Crete, where the famous Minotaur was conceived, and the northern lands connecting western Greece and Anatolia was widely made up of woodland plains with smaller neutral clans and tribes populating the coastline. Achilles was a young prince of Phthia, a kingdom situated in the north of Greece. As the elected leader of the Achaean clan, Achilles maintained a duty to the other clans of western Hellas. The word Achaean, meaning the culture of tribes and kingdoms that dominated the south of western Hellas, also known as Achaea. Don't worry about remembering these details, they are just for fun, and they also might not be 100% correct because I am not a historian, I just do this for my own enjoyment. Should Helen, the queen of Sparta, be put in danger, all the Achaean heroes would come to protect her and her husband, the king of Sparta. Unfortunately, life. such a thing did happen, as a cocky Trojan prince by the name of Paris abducted her and whisked her off to the golden fortress city of Troy. For many of the Achaeans, this was not only a terrible crime against their honour, but their chance to seek glory by raiding the fabled city, which was known by all to be the richest and greatest in the world. The story of Troy was not the only legend told among the people of Hellas. Young Achilles, Prince of Phthia, was the son of a sea goddess, and was destined to be the greatest warrior of his generation, brought up by his father as a fighter alongside many other exiled children who the king of Phthia, Peleus, had fostered. And with that very condensed bit of background out of the way, we can turn to young Prince Achilles, who had been fighting a difficult turf war, his first war, against one of the local clans, the Elopians. 
As he did so, communications arrived from the most prolific of the Achaean factions, Mycenae, ruled over by King Agamemnon. The Mycenaeans wanted to conduct trade. No doubt this would be their way of weaseling into Achilles' good books, leading to more diplomacy down the line. Achilles hadn't met the king yet, but he wasn't his biggest fan. Agamemnon was known around the world as a power monger, warring with and subjugating lesser clans under his will. But the resources were welcome, and good relations with the powerful king might benefit Phythia later down the line. Shortly after accepting the trade, more communications arrived, this time from the Achaean clan of Salamis, ruled over by Ajax the Greater, a monster of a man who was famous for his huge size and stature. They requested a non-aggression pact, an agreement that neither faction would take hostile action against the other. Again, Achilles wasn't too thrilled by this, as Ajax was another competitor. Surely he would have been the greatest warrior among the Achaeans if not for Achilles. Accepting a non-aggression pact with Salamis could have caused the approval of Phythia's other neighbours to wane, which was always a balancing act, so Achilles declined this deal. There would be more chances to enter friendly diplomacy with the Achaean kings later. While the Achaeans were preparing for war in the south, the Trojans had been busy in the east, and it was not long before blue flags were spotted on the horizon, Trojan transport ships. In the Iliad, the Achaeans prepared for years and years to amass the biggest army the world had yet seen, to sail across the great Aegean Sea and besiege Troy. However, the developers of Total War Troy had clearly not received this memo, as in this game, the Trojans come to you, and no, that is not caused by the Radius mod, this happens in the vanilla game too. With the Trojan invasion imminent, Achilles, who up to this point had been raiding their lands of the Olympians, or Olympians, had decided it was time to get a move on, and advanced his army to the Olympian capital of Histea. The sheer sight of Achilles and his army caused one of the defending Olympian armies to turn and run, leaving just the walled city's garrison for the Phythians to deal with. The siege of Histia was messy, and a more measured approach could have resulted in fewer Phythian lives lost, but Achilles did not have the time to be more cautious, and the city garrison stood no chance anyway. After the battle, Histia was annexed under Phythian control, and the raiding of the settlement's stores overturned a large amount of food supplies that would help to support the expansion of the Phythian army. There are several Olympian gods that the ancient Greeks worshipped, and as I stated in the intro, not all of them were on the same side. Athena, Hera, Poseidon, and Hephaestus took the side of the Achaeans, while Aphrodite, Ares, Apollo, and Artemis backed the Trojans. A temple to the mighty goddess Athena, deity of honourable war and defence, would be constructed in Histia, and in turn, she would bless the Phythians with strengthened shield arms. While Achilles was busy in the south, Phythian heroes and soldiers in the north began to mobilise to defensible positions on the east coast of the territory, preparing to meet the Trojan invaders. On the eve of battle, a hecatomb, which was a very large sacrifice, was performed in dedication to Athena. Instead of landing on the farthest eastern shoreline of Phythia, the Trojan ships sailed south around the peninsula that hooked around the bay of Teleon, the capital city of Phythia. They would enter the wide waterway that ran between Telion and Histia, and could then attack either settlement. While Achilles had cut the head off the Elopian snake by taking their capital, the clan had not yet been wiped out, and maintained territory to the south of Histia. Achilles sent a scout to learn exactly what they had left to deal with, and whether a counter-attack was on the way. Unfortunately for Achilles, the scout uncovered a much larger force than he had been expecting. After considering his options, and the imminent Trojan threat, Achilles decided to stay in his strong, defensible position, behind the walls of Histia, and let them come to him. It was their home after all. Trojan ships entered the river and bypassed both Histia and Teleon, instead attacking the small village of Olazon, that was located on the peninsula itself. The Trojans, in all their royal gold and purple, had underestimated the resolve of the Phythian people. The invading force was sent packing, running from the battlefield to warn their friends. The enemy force had belonged to Ilion Imbrosos, a northern Trojan clan, likely seeking to prove their worth to the Trojan royals of Greater Troy. 
A further prayer to Hephaestus, the Olympian craftsman and blacksmith, was answered, and once more the Phthian troops were bolstered by the divine favour of a god, this time strengthening their weapons and armour. With the first wave of Trojan invaders successfully routed, Achilles mustered his army in the south, preparing to deal with the Elopian's last stand. However, a misstep in logistics, or perhaps a miscalculation from myself, left Achilles and his troops exposed between Histia and the southern territory of the Elopians, who saw the opportunity and took it. Against overwhelming odds, Achilles' force watched the vast numbers of blood-raged Elopian troops storming towards them and, once again, the son of a god proved that he was not meant for death by mortal hands, least of all by these guys who just made a really bad decision in thinking they could fight Achilles. The victory was brutal, as Achilles' Phythians expertly demonstrated their skills as flankers engaging the back lines of the much larger force, inciting mass panic among the enemy. Achilles spared the captives, taking them on to aid the army. They would be able to carry the supplies and baggage. After winning a battle in Total War Troy, the victor can decide what to do with the remaining battle captives. I often chose the option to take them on as a workforce, uh, yes, I am avoiding the word slavery a little bit here, while fighting the Western Hellenic factions, as I didn't want to execute them and anger their friends and allies any more than I already had and I envisioned that Achilles would want to show mercy to the people that he intended to rule over. The cities of the Elopians would become very prosperous under the Phthians in the near future. In a swift final battle, the Elopians were wiped out, and Achilles could finally turn his attention to the Trojan invaders, who would surely not make the same mistake of underestimating the Achaeans again. Not long after, the Dardanians, ruled by Aphrodite's own son Aeneas, united with Troy against Phthia. Achilles' divine gifts were now on display for all to see, but what would another god-born warrior bring to the table? The war was quickly becoming much larger. With the province of Elopia now secured, Achilles would have to ensure that the infrastructure damaged during the fighting was rebuilt, and the local population was sated. The last thing the Phthians needed were revolts in their lands while defending against an invasion. Fortunately, the Elopian people did not seem averse to Phthian rule, and the public order problems were resolved quickly. It was reported that a group of cultists, said to declare loyalty to a great mythical beast, had been camped in the area for some time and were unnerving the locals. Achilles gathered his army and approached the cultists, who immediately took hostile action and fought with the Phthians on the plains outside Histia. Defeating the cultists led to the army capturing one of their revered creatures, a lesser griffin, a great winged beast with the body of a lion and the claws and beak of an eagle. Achilles brought it into the army knowing that having another god-given force of nature under his belt would prove very useful versus the increasing Trojan threat. Hearing of the Phthian success, out of the trees emerged Orion, the divine hunter and son of Poseidon, a sure sign of the Olympians' support. Orion was a fabled scout of immortal skill and was said to know the lands of Hellas impossibly well. However, at this time, I did not need a scout for the war, as I was mostly building up defences in preparation for the encroaching waves of enemies. For this reason, I sent him north, to uncover prospects of land that the Phthians may be able to expand to in the future, and to chart potential allies and trade partners on what would later come to be known as Macedonia, the place that connected East and West Hellas and the birthplace of Alexander the Great, hundreds of years later. The immediate threats surrounding Elopia had finally been quelled, but Achilles had to remind his subjects that, despite the welcome victory, this move had put Phthian territory bordering yet another potential threat, the Abantes, who commanded the long strip of land even further south that the Achaean forces would want to use as a landing point for their excursions across the Aegean. The southern border would have to be armed and defended. The kings of Achaea were preparing for war, and a great host was gathered. The council of kings, both old and new, experienced and eager, sorely missed one member, the unparalleled fighter that was Achilles, who they would certainly want to acquire, 
like a commodity or a weapon in order to defend from the Trojans and subsequently invade Anatolia, and thus a messenger was sent to Phthia. Despite his younger age, Achilles was not as different to the Achaean kings as he would have liked to think. Like all of them, he was a proud man, maybe to his detriment. Achilles did not like Agamemnon, or any of those other kings who claimed greatness without being able to demonstrate it. So when they came to his door, requesting that he join the Achaean host in massing for counterattack, he did not accept. He did not outright decline, however, as he knew in the back of his mind that help from such lesser warriors may one day come in need. If Achilles deemed the kings of Achaea as weaker than himself, the so-called champions of Meliboa and Phyllis weren't going to stand much of a chance. There is a mechanic in Total War Troy in which warriors from different kingdoms and clans step up to challenge Achilles' might by denouncing his name and calling on him to duel them, something that the proud prince simply could not ignore. These warriors were not always able to hold up their words though, as the son of a god simply waved his spear around and the first two backed down, witnessing his radiance and sharing stories of his godliness among their people. The Thessalian champion, however, thought himself worthy. Achilles grabbed his weapons, gathered a trusty entourage and trekked off to meet his challenge, leaving his army in Elopia. As Achilles temporarily disappeared off my campaign map, I considered how I would counterattack against the raiding Trojans. In my previous attempts at this game, of which there were a few, I recently struggled with the sneaky armies that randomly appeared in my lands after trekking stupidly long distances across the map just to fight my faction. This time I had been building tall, which is gamer talk for defensively, and reducing my expansion, which really worked with Achilles and Phythia. I also think that the Radius mod massively benefits this style of play with its economy rebalances. Focusing on experience producing buildings and garrisons was a viable strategy, and I would need the strongest troops to be able to stand against the golden armies of Troy. Achilles' Myrmidons, his closest and most elite warriors, were known the world over for their strength and skill, but I had to rely on quantity over quality for the time being as the higher level soldiers required high level infrastructure to unlock, and that would take time and resources. It was at this point that I noticed the Abantes had no allies and were also losing approval from the other Achaean factions. If there was ever a time to move on the Trojan sympathizers, which the Abantes were, it was now. Also I thought, unfortunately as soon as the Phythian armies rallied to move south, Dardanian ships were spotted to the northeast. Just in time, Achilles effortlessly won the duel against the Thessalian champion. Both warriors were left humbled by the other and accepted their result. There was no time to stand in ceremony though, as Achilles returned to his army to hear of both the new war with the Abantes and the Dardanian incursion. The area of land to the south of Elopia was home to the Abantes. This land, with Elopia included, was an island separated by a wide river. You can look at this on a real world map. I nicknamed this island, or more specifically the southern part of it, the Landing Strip for two reasons. It is long and mostly flat, and it is the perfect launching point for the Achaean invasion. However, before it could be used by the Achaeans, it would first have to be taken from the Abantes. The Siege of Eritrea, one of the Abantes' strongest settlements on the Landing Strip, came swift and kick-started the war. The annexing of the key settlement was a significant blow to the already distracted Abantes' military, who had also been struggling with their neighbours of Grea and Boeotia. A Phythian army headed by the general Automedon sailed round the east of the mountains that separated Elopia and the Strip and hit them from behind. The Abantes' war was short and highly efficient, and all the involved factions scrambled for their final settlement. After a difficult battle at Eritrea, the southern Phythian force still had to recover and would most likely not make it there, ahead of the other hungry generals. When the Abantes' last settlement finally did fall, and surprisingly it did fall to Phythia, the coastal staging area was freed up and the Phythians landed in good stead, with two more settlements under their control. Further north, Achilles intercepted the main Dardanian force quickly. With a lesser griffin, it wasn't long until the enemy army was routed and chased across the wilderness, as the previous invaders had been. 
everything was going quite well, and it did not look as though the Trojans were going to prove as much of a threat as first thought. That was until the Isle of Skyros fell. Skyros, a safe haven for the young Achilles when his mother wanted to keep him away from war, was invaded by a Trojan general. This obviously would not stand, and Achilles moved to liberate his once guardian Lycomedes. This was not caused by the enemy factions being sneaky or tactical, or even my error. It was caused by the activation of a quest. But I like the narrative, so let's roll with it. Not only did Skyros hold sentimental and diplomatic value to the Fithians, but it was a key strategic territory. With some Fithian engineering, it could become a stronghold against the northeastern Trojan incursions, with enough room for friendly armies to muster and counterattack from. This quest battle would be an important one. It was at this point that Patroclus appeared, stepping out from behind Achilles to help the war effort. In the lore, Patroclus was Achilles' chosen companion, much to the surprise of his father and Myrmidon friends. Patroclus was not known for his physical strength, but for his medical prowess, which he later discovered during the Siege of Troy. However, the Patroclus we see in this game is very different. He is a leader and a warrior, and an aggressive one at that. In fact, the whole Achilles Patroclus dynamic is completely different in Total War Troy, as Achilles already suffers greatly from his own mental instability, the greatest factor of which in the lore is Patroclus' death. Spoilers, sorry. To retain some semblance of this lore, I was originally going to impose some of my own handicaps on how I would play Patroclus. He would mainly serve as a backup army for Achilles, and would have to follow him around everywhere. I didn't stick to this for very long, however, as the game was simply too demanding. In the lore, he did not follow Achilles on raids, but instead remained in the camp, as he did not want to see war and death. Though, as you will find out, we are not talking about the same Patroclus. For some additional notes, Patroclus relies on favour with Hera, so I decided we would prioritise the construction of a temple in her name as soon as the space became available. He also decreases in motivation, affecting his army costs and stats, if left in enemy territory for a long period of time, which is more reason to keep him as a defender. Further trade from Mycenae provided the Fithians with wood, and military access granted to Diomedes of Argos advanced the staging of the war and the Achaean retaliation, as the various Achaean kings began to launch raiding parties across the sea. Meanwhile, Achilles and his army landed on the shores of Skyros and marched up to the commanding settlement and challenged the audacity of Dryops, the Trojan general who had dared to step foot on a place so important to the prince. Obviously, Achilles won the challenge. In a rare moment of stoicism, Achilles spared the life of his opponent. He could be angry and unreasonable, but this day he was not, as it benefited him so. After such an important show of strength, the people of Skyros, including Lycomedes, had their faith in Achilles as a warrior from the gods restored, and they requested that the island settlement of Skyros be confederated under Phythian control. Daedemea, the former king's daughter, joined Achilles' retinue and the fortification of Skyros began. Achilles, in all his might, was then presented a request from the court of Phythia to take the fight back to the Trojans. The mission, win three battles against the Pelasian tribes. First the Achaeans, then his own father, the king of Phythia. More eyes were turning to him. Declaring war on the Trojan prince Hector was the first step in this. In the lore, Thetis, his mother, had warned Achilles that his fate was to perish after defeating Hector in battle, but that didn't mean the Phythians couldn't engage his armies. This escalation of war must have been observed by Agamemnon, as shortly after, a further demand for military alliance arrived. While Achilles suspected the king of Mycenae was pushing for the prince's submission, it was about time to stop pretending that the war was not in full swing. This time, Achilles accepted. However, he was not yet willing to give ground completely. A subsequent request for a defensive alliance from Argos was declined, as Achilles knew full well that the Achaeans would try to gain more and more of his power, all the while putting his strategic position at risk. Of all characters to be caught out in the open with a small army, Paris appeared just off the coast of Skyros. This was not the first time this would happen, and I simply could not resist jumping on this opportunity to claim a win over the guy who started this whole thing. 
When Achilles' many ships finally bore down on the much smaller Trojan fleet, the battle took place on a nearby island, where the forces dismounted and lined up for battle. Aphrodite's son Paris was not the greatest fighter in the world, but he was a talented archer, like many of his Trojan brothers. Unfortunately, it seemed that the speed and size of a griffin was the perfect counter to this, and neither Paris nor his army, which had already suffered casualties at sea, stood much of a chance. The Trojan prince fell at the claws of Achilles' griffin, or so it appeared, for the Olympians had a tendency to whisk away their favourite mortals from deathly circumstances. The war was far from over, and Achilles expected retaliation from the other Trojan royals. As if drawn by battle, a mythical creature none other than the Minotaur, or perhaps a son of Asterion, the Minotaur who was supposedly slain by Theseus, arrived in Phythian lands, demanding nothing other than to bring ruin to the Trojans. From a gameplay perspective, I had no idea who to send this guy to. It seemed a bit dumb for the Cretan Minotaur to turn up in Northern Hellas, unless I could explain away some idea that it was simply a war beast looking for war. Anyway, sure enough, the colours of Prince Hector were sighted, coming from the northeast. Two armies of medium size would most likely not be a problem for Achilles, but he deemed it best to return to Patroclus and not squander his luck. Another round of challengers now stepped up to face Achilles, eager to prove that they could take on the man who had defeated a Trojan prince. But Achilles faced them all, only to stand once again alone. Another messenger, another mission this time to raise or sack Trojan settlements. Achilles returned to the in-progress fort of Skyros to plan his next moves, which would involve raids into Trojan lands, something he had yet to do. Hector's armies were spotted off the shore of the island, being wrecked by Mycenaean ships, and Achilles cursed at the fact that Agamemnon had gotten to beat Hector before he had. This was quickly turning into a game of numbers, and it was becoming difficult to remain focused on the true prize of Troy, as the Achaeans' enemies were expanding. Achilles planned to start with the south of Troy, and raid in a northern direction, as there were fewer enemy factions located there. However, sailing to the southern territories revealed an all too familiar flag. The Abantes, who had previously been thought wiped out, had settlements located here. Achilles' blood boiled, and he and one other Phythian general, Automedon, who had been successful in his previous endeavours and was now becoming more renowned for his actions, headed there on good wind. Sacking the Abantes' town of Velissus was easy, and their small garrison did not stand a chance against the sheer numbers of Achilles' more experienced no troops. However, while Achilles was recuperating, the Abantes' king, Elephenor, mounted an attack on Automedon's force, who were preparing for landing still embarked on their ships just off the beach. The critical battle was tough on both sides, as many of Automedon's important infantry suffered significant losses but the crutch victory versus both an Abantes king and a smaller reinforcing army that was also involved in the fighting was a huge blow to the enemy. Seeing that the Abantes were not to be underestimated, Achilles attacked the small settlement of Velissus once more, this time burning and toppling the buildings, sacking and raiding the food, construction and wealth stores, and finally raising it to the ground in a show of violent force. Afterwards, while both Phythian armies were replenishing and resting, Agamemnon again brandished his rivalry with Achilles, as one of his armies who had followed the two heroes landed north of Automedon and occupied the ruined Philissus, establishing the first Achaean outpost on the Trojan coast. Then I got a really strange notification. Apparently, Aphrodite had divorced Patroclus' partner from him. Which is odd for a number of reasons. A. Patroclus wasn't married, and B. His unofficial partner was Achilles, who would definitely not have abandoned him. Achilles was forced to marry Daedamea, so we can interpret this as Patroclus finding out about that and losing motivation to fight, but I just thought the event was particularly funny given the whole narrative. This game really does hate historical accuracy. The final battle against the Abantes took place at the city of Rontodos against a large garrison. But Achilles and his men were well rested, and their siege towers blocked out the sun as the Phythian soldiers launched themselves onto the Abantes' walls. Out of spite and anger, Achilles razed the city until it was nothing but ruins and dust, 
determined to put an end to the dispute once and for all. The Abantes flags were torn down, and the faction would be lost to history, stamped out of the Trojan War for good. Achilles couldn't wait to return to Skyros. On his way back, an odd offer from the far eastern Lycians, ruled by Sarpedon, a descendant of Zeus who you may know as King of Olympus and all the gods, was delivered in the form of a gift. Achilles accepted the rare granite, knowing it would serve well in the bolstering of Skyros. Unfortunately, this good gesture from Sarpedon and the Lycians, a culture of warriors who would later become known as the feared Persians, would be tested as Achilles' fame or infame grew. A Phythian spy by the name of Forbus, travelling by ship up the coast of the Trojan territories, located Troy. It would be no easy feat to siege. The proud people of Troy are eager to protect their city. The garrison forces replenish losses at an incredible rate. When fighting a battle against the garrison of Troy, auto-resolve is not available. Foreign agent actions will never succeed against Troy. The Golden City had a huge garrison of elite Trojan soldiers and nobility. Truly, this was a city blessed by the gods. Who could ever scale such immense walls? Agamemnon believed he could, with the combined might of all the Achaeans. Therefore, Achilles believed he could too, as he knew he was so much the better fighter. While all of this was happening, the homeland of Phythia was defending against Trojan and Dardanian incursions, which was something that would only increase as the war went on. Our focus on Achilles is the key to this campaign, but it is important to reference some of the vital battles that the defending Phythian generals encountered, as without this wall of bronze and these patient heroes defending the homeland and Phythian territories, Achilles and his armies wouldn't have been able to receive the supplies that he needed to mount his invasion. A very close battle on home turf versus a much more advanced Trojan force really showed me how important good map design is to settlement battles in this franchise. On the Warhammer 2 and 3 maps, which are maps featured in other popular and recent Total War games, this kind of holdout victory would simply not be possible, which is a shame, because that is what Siege Defense is all about, holding out and utilising a town or city's layout to your advantage in a tooth and nail situation. In real life, sieges could go on for months or years, and the Siege of Troy lasted over 10 before anything interesting even happened. This is Total War at its best in my opinion, as it really showcases the clutch, intense victories that are won by a hair's breadth. I will refer to some of these key moments as we go, because as interesting as Achilles and the main protagonists of these stories are, they would be nothing without their support networks of friends and allies. Achilles, who was high on his bloodlust and was eager to compete with Agamemnon, changed his plan to raid up from the south, and mustered his men, setting sail from the mouth of the river Troed. Joined once again by Automedon, the two forces were disappointed to sight a very heavily guarded coastline full of walled cities with enormous garrisons. A proper raid would require much planning, patience, luck. However, in his hubris, Achilles was caught ahead of Automedon by three waiting Trojan forces. Completely overextending, Achilles' force dug in to face the horde of enemies, but even he knew he could not face this many enemies at once. There was nowhere to run. Achilles and his most trusted warriors fought like hell, sending many a soul to Hades, but ultimately could not stand up to the waves and waves of enemies who were ready to throw themselves onto the Phythian spears, perhaps in revenge for their allies who had fallen, or to restore the honour that Prince Paris had lost. One by one, Achilles' troops were overwhelmed and he was beaten down. Well, sort of, he actually broke here, which was kind of amusing and frustrating. Despite not even crossing blades with the esteemed Hector, who he was destined to kill. And the Trojan fleets did not stop there, as they rolled around the coast and straight into Automedon, who attempted to mount a similar defence on the coast, but ultimately failed, as his men could not hold off the large force ahead of him. Automedon fell, the Minotaur fell, and his men scattered. Not without merit though, as the Trojan Prince Hector was left almost equally broken. Phythia's two largest armies wiped out in an instant, and the world would surely hear all about it. Achilles, a weakling, beaten by Hector. 
However, all was not lost. Before Patroclus could even hear of the news, Achilles appeared in Skyros. In his possession, taken from a long dead general or hero, he held a pot of oil created by the titan Prometheus, the very god who created the humans. With this oil, Achilles disappeared seconds before his death and was plonked straight back on the island of Skyros. His army was gone, his friends were dead, but this was far from over. They had stopped his snowballing assault, but the back and forth was only just beginning. Once again, Skyros became a home to the Phthian generals, as Achilles bolstered his army with new, well-equipped troops, the Phthian elites. Spearmen and swordsmen, those with clubs, javelins, and slings, all glittering in bronze and gold. This was not any ordinary army, this truly was the army of a prince. As they had once before, flocks of birds appeared over Skyros, encircling and darkening the sky, the sign of a dark omen. Was invasion coming? Was Hades angry that Achilles had cheated death? South of Skyros and to the east of the southern Phthian territories, Dardanian and Hectorite armies were spotted. Achilles and Patroclus embarked and sailed south to intimidate the invaders, but it was Diomedes who gave chase. With a huge army, both he and the fleeing invaders disappeared into the fog of war. But, eager to prove himself worthy once again, Achilles did not turn back to Skyros. One enemy fleet had been left behind on a low wind. Achilles took this opportunity and moved to attack, only to find a second, much larger Dardanian fleet nearby. Fortunately, armies from both Salamis and Argos appeared to help, and left the enemy fleets broken and routed. The allied Achaean fleets were proving quite helpful in getting Achilles out of trouble, and he hated this. From now on, he would be much more cautious. Back on Skyros once again, a friendly face, General Automedon, reappeared, taking command of one of the new armies by Achilles' orders. With his army almost at full strength, the prince and his trusted leaders planned to employ a different strategy, and instead aimed to cut off one of Dardania's island territories, Lemnos in the north, which homed to the walled city of Marina, was a great source of bronze and was said to conceal the forge of the crafting and blacksmithing deity Hephaestus. Achilles, Patroclus, and Automedon set sail for the north, sailing close to the shores of nearby islands, as Patroclus's fleet was not blessed by Poseidon in the same way that Achilles was, and would surely attract storms or worse. All was not so simple though, as just as they had left, the dark omen came true and a message from Sarpedon of the far eastern Lycians arrived. I have seen how you comfort yourself in battle. You are a coward. You fight without honour and embrace no worthy cause. Truly, you are more alike dogs than kings. Although you do not deserve the glory of fighting me, I shall march against you and eradicate your line. Only then will the gods be appeased. Slowly, the whole of Eastern Hellas was being united against the Achaeans, and, more specifically, Achilles. He was a badass, but could he withstand this many enemies? The siege of Marina began with Achilles' encirclement of the city as he built siege towers. For the longest time, I used to avoid siege towers in Total War games, thinking it wouldn't matter how many losses I took as the replenishment or healing rates that units receive after winning a siege is huge. However, the fighting on the walls in this game can go on very long, and the Dardanian garrison, although not massive, was made of a very strong infantry fighting units, so I didn't want to take any risks. Also, with spies and lookouts dotted across the eastern sea towards the Dardanian homelands, I would be able to see incoming armies and react with Achilles if necessary. While the siege was prepared, Automedon and Patroclus were tasked with attacking the only other Dardanian settlement on the island, Polyocne, located east of the main city in the pine forests that were common to northern Hellas. With Agamemnon and the other Achaeans fighting invaders in the south, they were averting a huge problem for me, especially as a Lycian army appeared very close to the shoreline. Not only was this inconvenient timing for me, but I couldn't even attempt to negotiate with the Lycian faction due to the antagonist mechanic which caused Sarpedon to send the hostile message that I read earlier. 
I understand why this is a feature, and it has potential, but with how broken the diplomacy and AI is in this game, which it is broken, it is simply frustrating to have to deal with another half-baked feature like this. I know that it is called Total War and not Total Diplomacy, but I really wish Creative Assembly would properly assess their new mechanics before adding them, as diplomacy is a huge part of war, and it is a delicate thing to get right. The aforementioned Lycian force then attacked the southmost Fithian settlement, Charistus, which was taken from the Abantes much earlier on. Charistus had a much larger garrison than the Lycian force was made up of, and obviously I won the defence. The fact that the Lycian army even attempted to attack the strong settlement is blatant proof of how dumb this game could be. Two more assaults on the town of Charistus resulted in two more difficult victories. The town was essentially a fortress position now, as its garrison and its defender Alceus truly deserved to be rewarded for their resolve and stubbornness. Armies of Hector and Lycia broke on the town's defences and were quickly mopped up by passing Achaean fleets on their way east. The Battle of Polyocne was Patroclus' first siege, and Automedon's first with his new army. The pine forests of the northern island were very different to the deserts of Skyros, and I couldn't help but look around at the gorgeous backdrop while the Fithian armies methodically pushed into the settlement, making the most of slingers and flanking tactics among the winding Hellenic streets. The bronze producing town would be very helpful for raising new elite armies. When upgrading Patroclus, I decided to focus on defensive traits and skills in line with what I think his character should be like, despite the fact his class is called a Ravager. Back in Phthia, Patroclus hunted down a fleeing Lycian force, shouting, They will be our slaves, and let me at them. Total War, I think you got the wrong guy. Who's looking for a fight? Towers and ladders were built, and the Siege of Marina came shortly after. The garrison had already suffered considerable losses due to the encirclement of the city, and Achilles was joined by Patroclus to finish them off. My main concern, the fighting on the walls, was alleviated after Achilles' Myrmidons and the elite Phthian warriors easily surrounded them and whittled away at their remaining members. Patroclus brought two units of chariots, which, once inside the walls, caused fear to the wavering defenders. Entering the city, he secured the walls of the Eastern Gate and executed his first enemy soldier. With Lemnos under Phthian control, there was much work to be done, as the island was only a short journey by sea from Troy itself, and a whole load of Dardanian and Trojan factions. The Temple of Aphrodite and Marina was rededicated to Athena, and Achilles considered his next move, possible expansion into the isles north of Lemnos. While some Trojan clans wanted to make their peace with Achilles, some were only just entering the war, as the Aegean Pelasians, the final large Trojan clan neighbour to the city of Troy, were united against Phthia. With this, the entire northeastern coastline was hostile. Sure enough, it did not take long for the Trojan clans to converge on Lemnos. In the counterattack on Polyocne, Hector's general dispatched a force of considerably high-level troops, Hector's elite. However, despite the initial intimidation, the town of Polyocne was laid out in a way that made it perfect for ranged units to successfully crossfire, catching the enemy in the sides and back. With a lot of slingers and some diversion tactics involving heavy spearmen, Hector's elite were sent packing in no time. Automedon came through yet again, proving to be one of Achilles' most valued generals, redeeming himself with his revenge on the Trojan prince's faction. Meanwhile, Achilles' spies sailed north to the islands owned by Ilion Imbrasos, discovering that they were not well fortified. Their sieges would be quick and easy, but still posed a problem, as there were many, many enemies to look out for that would surely want to capitalise on one of the three armies on Lemnos leaving the island. The difficulty in taking over these northern islands lied not in their garrisons, but in good timing, so to avoid the enemy receiving reinforcements. Additionally, Thassos, one of the cities on the westernmost island, was owned by a neutral faction. For Achilles, this meant less loot and conquest. For me, this meant missing out on enacting an edict that would benefit the cities in the region once I had taken them, which is something you can only do when you own a whole region. 
Achilles, Automedon, and Patroclus prepared for more waves of enemies. The Dardanian counterattack finally appeared on the horizon, leading me to believe they were caught in another conflict somewhere else that was draining their efficiency. And in yet another unbelievable moment that could only have happened in a game as dysfunctional as this, Sarpedon himself arrived at Charistus with a further two huge Lycian armies in his wake and failed to take the small settlement. I decided to auto-resolve this historic moment and to try to banish it from my mind. One of the first peace treaties Fithia did accept came from a northern faction located near Lemnos called Enos after they launched a second attack on the Fithian homeland and realised it was never going to happen. They offered a lot of gold, and it meant I would not have to worry so much about expanding to the northern islands just yet. Achilles won't often show mercy, unless you really make it worth his while, and a lot of gold that can be invested in infrastructure and good soldiers is a valuable asset indeed. In a twisted turn of fate, aka due to a misclick and some dumb game mechanics, Patroclus was left on the coast of Marina, and Paris practically teleported to him. Perhaps it was divine intervention from Ares or Aphrodite, or perhaps it was just bad game design, but the enemy army appeared out of nowhere and defeated his. For the sake of continuity and finishing this goddamn game, let's just imagine he washed up on the shore of Marina and narrowly survived. Total War Troy is seriously unfair and annoying sometimes. Achilles, hearing of this, got very angry and hit Paris in a gruelling battle, trudging through mud to face the prince. This guy would seemingly never die, but Achilles could at least give him a telling off. Two more unnecessary enemies, two more factions whose deaths would ultimately contribute to Fithia's military economy. Aethria, another completely neutral faction, declared war on Achilles, as did Terea, who were united against us in allegiance with the Trojans, I think. Aethria were the owners of Thassos, however, which meant Achilles might be able to take the gold mine sooner than first thought. Everything was going okay. Until the Thessalians and the Aetolians, two factions located just north of Achaea in the west of Hellas, declared war on Phthia, and everything went to sh**. Actually, it wasn't as bad as I first thought. The two clans had clearly waited until the majority of the Achaean focus was on Troy, before deciding they could utilize this opportunity to expand. Fortunately for me, they were still a distance away, and while I hadn't been expecting an attack from the west, that didn't mean that the Fithian cities of Telion and Histia weren't fortified. No, the Fithian defence was as strong as ever, and the western traitors would simply provide more resources for us as they fell on the battlements. A new army in Telion was being mustered, comprised of elite Fithian units, to defend from the west. Surprisingly, this was not the only new war in the west, as Greia, who had previously helped in the destruction of the Abantes, attacked the Boeotians, who controlled the land between Phthia and Achaea. Their ancient city of Thebes was a fortress guarded by the legendary Spartoi, a cult of warriors grown like crops from the teeth of a serpent. Seeing an opportunity, Achilles travelled to the island of Saos, which was located directly north of Lemnos. The siege of Saros was successful, and finally Phthia had a stone-producing settlement under control. This would be huge for the development of more advanced infrastructure in the settlements that regularly came under siege. The production of stone meant Phthia could build guardhouses to bolster garrisons across more settlements, and the civil buildings would result in better public order and resource management. Then, I noticed that Sarpedon had been up to some mischief, and had claimed the mythical Hydra as a pet, earning the trust of the Hydra cultists, who were similar to those that Achilles had fought earlier, the ones who worshipped the griffin. I had avoided the mythical beast hunt mechanic up until now, due to the fact that they can be a resource sink, and I needed everything I had to maintain the defence against the Trojans, but I finally felt it was time. The Phthians would hunt the noble griffin patriarch, a beast to match Achilles' pride and resolve, and more importantly, to combat the writhing heads of the venomous Hydra. The griffin patriarch would first have to be roused from its nest, which was said to be located far in the wilderness of the north. An expedition was prepared, firstly by mustering troops. I wanted to employ cheaper, lighter troops that would be able to travel and scout easier, but the angry, 
army strength bar did not seem happy about this, so instead I opted to spend some precious gold to afford elite tier heavy Fithian soldiers. With the preparations made, the expedition started their journey into the untamed north of Akia. The hunters could barely imagine the hardships they would face. Helen, previous queen of Sparta and the entire reason the Trojan War had started, was sighted just across the sea from Lemnos. So close, but so far, this war was entering a terrifying penultimate phase. Achilles might have sailed directly there, raided the city she resided in, and brought her back, but he wasn't going to risk his men for the estranged wife of a man he didn't know. He was doing this for glory and pride. Thessalian raiding back in Teleon marked the first time the local populace had had to fear incursion since the war with the Elopians, but the strong garrisons nearby meant they had nothing to fear. I opted to hold steady and maintain the strong defensive positions. The raiding was less than ideal, but the Fithian people had faith in the gods and their leaders, and the economy could take the hit for now. In other news, Enos again declared war on Achilles. I made a mental note not to let them off a second time, unless they paid really, really well. The Griffin expedition made camp in a land known as Illyria. The light rain and deep green forests were alien to the troops as they trudged through the foreign terrain. Coming to a stop, some troops split off to scout ahead of the main force, leaving the warriors more tired but better prepared in case of attack from foreign enemies. A combination of bad weather and strange, savage locals unnerved the Fithian expedition and made the journey slow and painstaking. The army were feeling fatigued, but their slow, methodical movement boosted their missile resistance and they gained experience that would certainly be valuable in what must be an inevitable upcoming battle. Another very questionable war declaration came from the Dionysians, who were an Achaean island clan located in the southeast of the Aegean Sea. Again, I'm not sure why they suddenly decided they hated the Fithians, but hate they did. This was becoming a common occurrence as the war grew and grew until it encompassed the whole of Hellas. A battle between Antomedon and a Tyrian force resulted in one of the most enjoyable and effective battles I had throughout the entire campaign. Though slow at first, the victory came quickly, as Automaton's before its time line formation strategy allowed our slingers to pepper their troops until they were forced to attack. Their army consisted of a horde of militia backed up by a few high level soldier units. An uphill battle turned heavily in favour of the Fithian army as the line infantry wrapped around and flanked, causing a mass rout shortly after, leaving only 100 of the enemy troops alive. Automedon was nothing if not efficient, and he proved this time and time again as he mopped up another hostile army from the nearby sea. Despite a large force massing on the coast of Saos, Achilles decided not to intercept, instead waiting for a battle on home turf that would result in better defensive capabilities. Another really dumb assault from Enos that was an auto-resolve. With all of the Achaean tribes attacking and claiming the Trojan lands, Achilles felt a bit indignant. He would strike when the time was right, however. He was chosen by the gods, and he knew this to find a glorious death at Troy, and so he would. In the northern wilderness, the Griffin expedition met the Illyrians, a savage people of godless tribes and death cults, as they approached a coalition belonging to some of the most bloodthirsty leaders. One morning, the expedition awoke to find some of the tribespeople waiting outside their camp, and decided to challenge them. The Fithians found a river where the Illyrian women and children went to wash and play. Taking advantage of this, they took them hostage and forced the savage warriors to let them pass. A bonus to morale and infantry charge would be helpful in the future. With another war declaration from the Sassonis, the north coast joined the east in being an entire coastline that hated the Fithians. Fithian scouts sighted Aeneas king of the Dardanians to the northeast as he moved towards Saos with a large army. While this was threatening, it did present an opportunity for Automedon to attack the capital of Ilion Imbrasos. This changed quickly, however.
however, as another large Dardanian force that had been hanging around Lemnos instead headed for Automedon. This was not good. The assault on Saos could have been managed, but now Automedon was caught off the shores of Imbrasos. Seeing the attacking force, he ordered his fleet to turn around and flee, hoping to put enough distance between him and the Dardanians, leaving both Imbrasos and Saos relatively free of armies. After an easy auto resolve at Saos, the Dardanians chased down Automaton with seemingly mythical speed. An equal balance bar on the battle screen didn't fill me with confidence, but the two reinforcing armies were what really convinced me this battle was already lost. On top of that, bad omens from the priestess meant this might be the end for Automaton. In his classic style, the army set up in a big line, bristling with spears and swords. Light spears and javelins took the flanks and waited for the Trojan mass to appear out of the brush. Hopefully, I crossed my fingers, the AI was going to be done. A sighting of enemy chariots only made tensions worse. Automedon put up a great fight, but the Dardanians whittled down the front line of the Fithian troops, and soon Automedon was left surrounded by the enemy, locked in a duel with Aeneas, the son of Aphrodite, himself. The defeat was valiant, and the Dardanians were left broken and scattered, and would certainly be easy pickings for any Achaean ships in the area. Despite the complete wipeout, this would not be the end for Automedon. Not yet. And much, much further north, the Griffin expedition came to the river Istros as they battled with the relentlessness of nature. The river was too fast to cross, so they asked some local fishermen for help and were directed to a camp of traders who used the river for ferrying goods. However, before they could visit the traders, they spotted a centaur, who apparently wanted to speak with the Fithians. Hopefully, he would prove to be a good guide to cross the river. Centaurs were known for being wise and especially knowledgeable of their lands. The centaur elder introduced himself as Conchaos, and he agreed to lead them to a hidden path across the river as he joined the expedition with a group of his kind. The expedition came to a huge bridge that they had somehow missed when searching the riverbanks. It was big enough to carry an entire army, and Conchaos hinted that once it had long ago, though they had been heading the opposite direction, south. Achilles returned after winning a duel, and immediately prepared to seek revenge for Automedon's defeat, killing Cantheus, one of the generals who took part in the battle. With Automedon and Patroclus out of action, Achilles could not afford to wait. The siege of Imbrasus, capital of the Ilian Imbrasus clan, would go ahead without any siege towers. Backup from Lemnos in the form of a small skirmish army would aid in the flanking of the city's walls. Achilles needed to win this battle quickly and without taking many casualties. The threats of Dardania, Enos, and Troy were not far away. For the first time, Achilles resorted to using his troops as fodder for the arrow towers and dangerous Trojan archers. After some very effective flanks and some very efficient fighting on the walls, the Fithians chased the Imbrasans through the city streets, across a small river running through the settlement and up to the plaza, panicking them and forcing them into choke points. The siege was awesome, and it was another that I would put up there as my favourite from this game so far. The enemy could not handle the number of Fithian troops, and much Trojan blood was spilt on the hot red sand. Achilles and the Fithians occupied the city after thoroughly looting it. It felt good to finally make some progress. The Achaeans' combined might and wealth made their conquest easy, but Achilles and his Fithians would never be matched in one-to-one -one combat, and would prove essential for the final battle at Troy. Things were not as straightforward in the far north, however, as the Griffin expedition journeyed to the Riffian Mountains. Despite one man nearly drowning in a brook, this leg of the journey passed rather uneventfully, and the natural landmarks became fewer. The Aramaspoi, a race of wild men with a single large eye in the centres of their foreheads, emerged from nowhere and startled the expedition. Their leather attire glittered in gold as they studied the Fithians. However, Conchius greeted them excitedly, and soon signalled for the men to join. The Fithians explained to Conchius and the Aramas boy what their mission was, and both gravely agreed to help further.
The island fortress of Skyros had laid undisturbed for a considerable amount of time, and the garrison had simply monitored the passing Trojan and Achaean armies. However, Dion, the leading general who had been stationed there since before Phythia had first taken control of the settlement, finally decided he had had enough and wanted to search for Achilles in the north. And so he did, beginning his island hopping journey in the same way Achilles, Automedon and Patroclus had before him. One step forward, two steps back. The Northern Theni had also declared their support for Troy, perhaps due to Phythia's expansion north. Bathocles of Teleon, an elite archer who had become very important later on, moved his shiny new elite army towards the Thessalian capital of Pharsalus. The city was the final remaining Thessalian settlement, so what foul spirit possessed them to war with the mighty Phythians? was unknown. Bathocles would not ponder this for long, however, as he laid siege to the walled settlement and prepared to defend against potential counterattacks. It was not long before Bathocles' siege of the Thessalian capital was interrupted by an Aetolian army that appeared out of the fog. Bathocles retreated, but onto foreign land, and I worried about whether a further counterattack would come. This was the better option, however, than fighting directly outside the city. The Aetolian follow-up on Bathocles resulted in a close victory for the Phythians, after routing their elite chariots by swamping them with spears and a full surround of the Aetolian line. Bathocles was then free to move on the enemy city, but his troops were tired and injured, and another enemy army may have been hiding just out of sight. Bathocles besieged the city of Pharsalus once more, and this time the commanding general sallied out to fight. With a strong line and a swift flank, Bathocles and his Phythians easily surrounded and routed the enemy force, looting and occupying the settlement, and prepared to abandon it, taking the Thessalians' riches. The Boeotians were down to Thebes and one other town, as Greia's invasion increased in velocity, and I started to worry about what this might mean for the security of the Western territories. And then, in yet another classic Total War moment, Boeotia declared war on Phythia, something that, if it were a human player, I could only have put down to a misclick. This move was literally insane, and practically doomed the Boeotians as there was no way they could survive a full-on attack from Phythia if I chose to conquer them. Finally, after a long time of indignance, Phythia entered a defensive alliance with one of the Achaean factions. Diomedes of Argos demanded a large payout of bronze, no doubt to fuel the counter-invasion, but this seemed like a good idea as Achilles was generating more enemies than friends. Close to the summit of their destination, the Griffin expedition spotted a huge nest perched on top of a nearby mountain. It could only have belonged to the creature they were searching for, and looked abandoned. Some of the men petitioned to take a closer look, but the majority decided it would be better not to be greedy, and opted to climb to a higher, safer location to get a better lay of the land. However, when the expedition got further up, noises in the forest around them signalled that they were not alone. With the tremendous roar of a great beast, figures emerged from the forest, more of the Aramas boy, though this time they were certainly not friends. The option to initiate the battle became available, but it was locked, stating that my general was embarked and was not eligible. This confused me for a time, as I thought that if the general was in the expedition, how could he be embarked? I was confused about this, until I realised I had to use Achilles to fight the battle, for some strange reason, not the army I had geared up specifically to fight it. I decided to hold off on this battle, as Achilles was indisposed, but I knew there would come a time when the Griffin Patriarch would join the Phythian army. With the Trojans distracted by the Achaean invasion in the south, Mycenae were making strong headway up the coast. Achilles took advantage of the quieter seas and sailed north to raid their lands. Further east, Achilles won an efficient victory at the city of Sestos, another settlement ruled by the Imbrosos clan. At first, it looked as though he was going to lose, but after some losses and a very quick duel with an enemy general, the Imbrasians routed and surrendered. Achilles sacked the city and prepared to raise it to the ground. With Achilles left exposed, the Phythians were relying on the Achaean distractions in the south to divert Trojan attention away from his tired men, as Mycenae were closing on Troy's homeland. 
Achilles decided it was finally time to cut off the enemy's northern reinforcements. Back home, Bathocles moved south to counter the Thessalian and Boeotian threats, and a small faction located south of Thrace, the Macedonians, joined the bandwagon in declaring war against Phthia. In a very unexpected move, Mycenae defeated and vassalized Paris's faction. Helen was nowhere to be found in his final remaining territory though, so on went the war. Then, somewhat amusingly, the Dardanians attacked Paris, winning and resulting in the destruction of his factions once and for all. Paris would not be coming back again. One Trojan prince down, many to go. Surely, Hector would not take the death of his brother lightly. Continuing to sweep across the northeast, Achilles swiftly and efficiently attacked the city of Enos, home of the Enos clan. The small garrison put up a decent fight, but were ultimately surrounded in the town centre by the Phthians' superior numbers. Dion arrived at Soas after his journey north from Skyros, and he found that the city had been sacked and occupied by enemies. His army, eager and raring to get into a fight, retook Soas easily. His troops were very well prepared after their time on Skyros. By this point, I was auto-resolving most fights. There were just so many of them, and my generals were of high enough levels that they were, more often than not, in my favour. I had been playing the game for a long time by this point, and really wanted to get to the climax, but could not afford to rush it, or I would surely overextend and regret it. Bathocles was chased back north by armies I didn't really want to fight, I traded food and bronze to crush some bandits outside Histia, and the Thessalians advanced on Eritrea. Bathocles managed to snipe an enemy army that was embarked in the sea near Teleon, and then beat two of his pursuers without reinforcements. Shortly after, the Trojan clan of Ilion Imbrasus was destroyed, marking an important milestone in the war. A lot was happening all over Hellas, the entire world was at war, and many had doubts about whether sacking Troy would actually end the fighting. No one would be victorious at this point, the fighting just went on and on and on. With Mycenae one city away from Troy, warriors on both sides began to ask whether the fighting was worth it. Achilles' Myrmidons looted and occupied Enos, gathering the remaining resources in preparation to abandon the settlement, and he and his army embarked back into their ships and sailed westwards towards the Aethrian's homeland, ready to teach them a hard lesson. Skyros, which had been left largely untouched up until this point, became surrounded by more than a few Lycian armies, headed by Sarpedon himself. In no time, Achilles' second home was besieged. With no friendly forces in the vicinity, this almost certainly spelt destruction for the city that I had spent so much time upgrading and defending. After finally sacking two Pelasian settlements and fulfilling his quest from home, Achilles acquired Briseis, a slave girl who he took under his wing, and a very, very large amount of experience for him and all of the other Phthian heroes. The march to Troy, the next epic mission, would finally lead Achilles to the lands of Troy in aid of the gathering Achaeans. Achilles and Dion sandwiched a bunch of Aethrian fleets just off the coast of their easternmost settlement, wiping out the majority of their existing armies and signalling that it was finally time to push onwards to their settlements. The siege of the island city Thassos was a long time coming, and Achilles' victory led to a significant gold production town under Phthian control, which was the first time the Achaean kingdom was able to produce it on its own. While this was happening, Phthian spies operated to the northwest, poisoning the wells used by the enemy soldiers, and spreading rumours of sedition within the town garrisons, softening up their defences before the proper results began. With Skyros under siege, Bathocles, unsure as to whether he would make it in time, diverted to the island to repel the Lycians and Sarpedon. Sailing across the sea, then marching across land, then sailing again, he pushed his troops to the limit, aware of the losses that would be suffered if the Lycians were able to capture a major settlement just off the coast of Phthian territory. Also hearing the news, Diopetes, a general who had been responsible for defending the peninsula on which Olizon lay, the first place the Trojans had attacked, mustered his men and sailed south. Two big armies could be enough to counter the invasion, but they would have to be quick. However, this was not meant to be, as the Battle of Skyros came too soon. 
The Lycians attacked with three armies, and the garrison of Skyrus put up a very good fight, grinding the enemy troops down at the entrances to the city's town square, but ultimately fell to the Lycian numbers, as the third army appeared and simply overwhelmed the exhausted defenders. Lycia's victory at Skyros came at a very tough cost, and the arrival of the Fithian armies, though late, caused one of theirs to break and run immediately. The retaking of Skyros was messy, involved lots of armies and losses, but the city was eventually returned to Fithian control, and the same mistake would not be made again. The abode of a Cyclops, a child of the sea god Poseidon, was discovered outside Marina. Such a creature would only submit to a hero as strong as Automedon, who was ready to reclaim his mantle as one of Fithia's most prevalent heroes, and enlisted the huge divine warrior, promising that Lemnos would soon be a tranquil place for the reclusive Cyclops to live. Achilles and Dion besieged the remaining Aethrian coastal settlements, but were forced to retreat when Thracian armies arrived out of the fog of war and reinforced the besieged Aethrians. The Aethrians counterattacked Dion, but he and his army had fled to the edge of a forest where they were able to easily wait out the enemy and defeat them with a surprise attack. The Aethrians' chariots got bogged down, caught in the long grass and foliage, causing them to be run down by Dion's spear troops. Achilles and Dion then joined up again to beat the combined armies of Thrace and Aethria in a landslide victory. An attack on Achilles resulted in an easy auto resolve for me and more experience further melding him into the divine warrior his fate intended. Back on the island of Saos, a divine craftsman appeared and approached Automedon. The Olympic craftsman was sent to the general by Hephaestus himself, and informed him that he would craft godly weaponry and armour for the army, as they were destined for greatness. Loads more armies arrived from the northeast, threatening to invade the Fithian island annexes and bolstering the Trojan north. Dion fought a group of Aethrians, the last within harmful distance. The enemy army bore down on Dion and his army with all their remaining might, elite chariots and spartoi, but were defeated by Dion's experienced forest fighters. Finally, after many trials and tribulations, Achilles and Dion pulled out of their invasion of the northwestern clans, deciding that they had done enough damage to set back the Aethrians and Thracians for a while. It was time to head for Troy. But instead of sailing directly to the mouth of the river Troad, they first hooked north to pay the Sassonians a visit. The Sassonian capital didn't last long, as Automedon sailed up from Saos to join the fight, and then cleaned up the remaining Sassonian armies. Achilles and Automedon prepared the settlements for abandonment and began to sail towards Troy. Finally, the Fithians were moving on Troy. Achilles arrived at Troy. Standing on the plains next to the river Troad, in front of the south gate of the great city. It was huge, and its garrison was even bigger. Troy's reputation preceded it, but Achilles had not yet faced an enemy that he couldn't beat. The closer to Troy he got, however, the closer to his prophecy he got, the one that declared his death. And to well-walled Troy did swift-footed Achilles march, to stand before the lords of the Achaeans. It was time to consolidate and prepare for the final siege, which started by finally entering defensive alliances with Mycenae and Salamis. The Council of Kings convened. The other Achaean kings, though most likely persuaded by Agamemnon, announced their discontent for Phthia's northern antics that had been undertaken while they had struggled on the shores of eastern Hellas. They demanded in return that the slave girl Briseis, who Achilles had rescued, was handed over to them. Achilles was not happy, but he handed the girl over indignantly, silently threatening to take the glory of sacking Troy all to himself if they made any more tasteless demands. In the Iliad, Patroclus argued with Achilles about this, and they eventually rescued Briseis from Agamemnon. However, Patroclus wasn't here yet, and he was not the same quiet, harmless and caring boy that the original epic portrayed. It is easy to view Golden Achilles and his faithful Myrmidons as the good guys in this story, but that is not the case. Many, many innocents were harmed in the Trojan War, and the Achaeans' lust for glory resulted in them subjugating and draining their lands around Troy. Brad Pitt's handsome hero is just one interpretation of the story, but despite the quest for glory, the Trojan War was far from it, and the worst was still to come. 
In a bid to get one up on Agamemnon and the other Achaeans, Achilles finally accepted the divine hunt for the legendary griffin Patriarch. Reinforced by the original expedition, the final hunt took place in the mountains high above Hellas, in a secluded place only reachable by guidance of the centaur elders and the Aramas boy. The battle began as three griffins descended on the Fithian armies, one a huge feathered beaked and clawed beast, at least double the size of the others. This was the Patriarch, and would be the perfect prized lord above Agamemnon and the rest of the Achaeans. Achilles and his men would first have to best it in battle. Bronze armour and spears surrounded the beasts, and rocks and javelins were flung over the heads of the soldiers, hitting the giant beast. The two weaker griffins did not take long to fell, but the Patriarch extended its wings and launched itself into the sky, much to the awe of the soldiers. It soared over their heads and across the giant crater that lay at the centre of the mountain habitat. The Fithians would have to give chase and split up into two separate forces, with Achilles leading one that consisted of the Aramas boy, centaurs and ranged troops, and the other made up mostly of elite melee fighters. The trees exploded and both forces were ambushed by Aramas boy. The one-eyed fighters brandished spears and javelins and some rode on horseback like no man had before. Both forces were caught unprepared and were funneled into a brutal, grinding battle at choke points at the edges of the great arena. Slowly, the Aramas boy's weaker weapons, armour and formations were ground down and they routed. The Fithians gave chase. It was not long before more griffins and the Patriarch attacked again. This time the armies were ready and javelins and stones flew once more, striking the beasts down. After the battle was won, the griffin expedition and the Patriarch appeared out of the trees next to the Achaean encampment to aid in the fight against Troy. And to the north, Automedon and Dion landed on Trojan soil, fighting outside the city of Sestos. Dion's army and Fithian spies softened up the city's defences by ambushing the armies camped on the outskirts and poisoning their provisions. The Trojans' allies knew of the siege, they knew the war was coming to a head, and they sailed for Fithia. The Boeotians, the Aethrians, the Thracians, and the Lycians all approached the lands of Fithia, where the experienced garrisons waited to defend their homeland. To ensure his best chances against the well-equipped Trojan princes, Achilles devised a plan to seek new armour. The island of Lemnos was said to house the great forge that the god Hephaestus used to create his divine weapons. Achilles would travel here and equip himself with armour befitting that of a god. However, his presence before Troy would be missed. Patroclus' plea to replace him until he returned was not a wise one, as Achilles would surely be the target for the Trojans but Patroclus demanded that he dress in Achilles' old armour to inspire the men. When Achilles returned, brandishing the finest bronze armour and weapons ever witnessed by man, he found Patroclus dead. Achilles swore vengeance on Troy, not for the first time, but maybe for the last. Achilles' vengeful glory would only be satiated by the complete eradication of the Golden City and its inhabitants. He besieged the city, along with Automedon and Dion from the north, the Griffin expedition, and a fifth army from Lemnos. Troy was surrounded by five armies. Its doom was close. Victory was almost assured, until Hector appeared from the east and attacked the expedition. The fight was brutal and both armies suffered. Hector, who was supposed to kill Achilles, was killed. And then appeared Aeneas of Dardania, son of Aphrodite. He challenged the besieging invaders, and his added numbers forced them to retreat. They would not win versus the three highly elite generals, two from Troy, with their armies. But Aeneas pursued them and cornered Achilles, Dion and the army from Lemnos. The numbers were equal, but the Trojan units were very highly experienced and very well equipped. This battle determined the fate of the Fithian invasion, and it took place outside the city walls, on the plate of Ilium. The Fithian troops attempted to form and maintain a line, but the Trojan archers were relentless and high in number. They peppered the defending Fithians from distance as the elite chosen and guards of Troy advanced on the less well-prepared Fithians. The battle took place on a hill, on which there were three lanes. The right-hand side featured a large open field with a small forest closer to the centre where one of the Fithian armies stood. 
There was a small farm compound to the left of this, on the other side of which was the middle lane, a narrow passage which could be blocked by soldiers and would likely dissolve into a grinding melee battle while ranged units supported from the sides of the passage. On the leftmost side was a hill, on which Achilles' army defended. The battle was a grind, and more reinforcements entered the battle as those who held the lines fell. The experience and martial prowess of the Trojans was met with the ferocity and anger of the Phythians, and the lines ground each other down bit by bit. Chariots raged through the lines, picking off the lightly armoured slingers and scouts, and flankers attempted to chase down the ranged troops. It was absolute chaos, and there was no strategy other than to outlast the other. Archers ran out of arrows and charged into the melee, adding their bodies onto the piles that now littered the previously green and yellow countryside. Aeneas fell, and so did the two other Trojan generals, but Achilles remained fighting. He fought and fought and cut down hundreds of elite Trojan soldiers, but his men fell dead all around him, and it was only a matter of time until he did too. The death of Achilles was a tragic one. Not only had he perished, but so did his generals, his trusted Myrmidons, and the Griffin Patriarch. The dead lay in piles, and blood soaked the sand. Though the Trojans had won, it was barely a victory. The garrison of Troy was very weak, but the simple fact was, it had survived, and Achilles had not. That would have been the end of the Phthian campaign if it hadn't been for the fact that Automedon had not been included in the battle. His army had been on the north side of Troy. Seeing the garrison leaving Troy, and the terrible battle that ensued, he prayed to Olympus so that they may forgive him as he marched his army into the depleted Golden City and began to raise it to the ground. Troy was destroyed, but where was the glory? The whole world was still at war. The Achaeans would grind each other into dust over the spoils and would barely make it home alive. Families had been torn apart, blood had been spilled, and Helen was nowhere to be found. No one had won the Trojan War. Hellas, the world, had never seen such violence, but also such camaraderie and advancement. After the dust settled, the warriors and heroes would be able to live out their eternal existences in Hades and Elysium, as a new world would be born from the breaking and erosion of the last. One of progression and wealth and culture, but certainly not one of peace. Hello again, it's me. If you've gotten to this part of the video, audio or text, I want to say thanks for sticking with it. And most importantly, I hope you've enjoyed it. Recently, I've been doing a lot of writing due to my new job as a writer. And this has led me to start reading more, which is also great. I've been reading and watching all sorts about ancient Greek mythos due to stumbling across a Stephen Fry audiobook on the subject, and since read, listened to, and watched a whole lot more. This video was inspired by an idea I had to play the Total War games as a sort of grand campaign, playing through each as the same or similar nation, and I expanded it to include a lot more games, so uh, keep an eye out for more when they come. What comes next in the story? Well, the Achaean generals struggled to sail home. Some made it back and were rich. Some made it and were killed, betrayed by their families. Agamemnon was murdered by a plot employed by his wife and another family member. Some didn't make it home at all, not yet anyway, Odysseus, I'm looking at you, who would struggle for over 10 years to make it to his home of Ithaca. The gods would fall into chaos as Greece entered its uncharted dark age and the humans took the mantle as the most powerful race on the planet. Or so they thought. If you know anything about me and my YouTube channel, you'll know that I have struggled for years and years to find a format that I wanted to make content consistently in line with, but I think this format just fell into my lap after I watched a load of other video essays on YouTube from the likes of Noah, Coldwell, Gervais, Writing on Games, Mandalore, Two Clicks Philip, and a bunch more. I don't expect to be able to live up to their standards quite yet, especially as this isn't really review content, but I just wanted to throw their names in anyway. And also, this video has really taken me a very long time to produce due to the fact I have a full-time job and a lot of other things going on. Um, so I really hope it's turned out in a way that 
I mean, I enjoy because that's kind of the main thing for me. I just want to be happy with it and release some good content, um, but also that you enjoy because that's what it's here for and that's why you'll stick around. I have really enjoyed the process of making this video, so I hope you have too. It's likely that there won't be any more War Thunder or Armor content on this channel for a while, as I took a long break from both those games and realized they weren't really what I was interested in creating around, especially the armor stuff, as some of the guys we played with were, like, very racist and bad, and I'm not either of those things, and they made content very hard to edit, etc, etc. Basically, don't play with racists, they are bad for everything. This game, Troy, is very dysfunctional and confusing and inconsistent, and after finally watching the film Troy, with Brad Pitt as Achilles, I think I started to understand where a lot of Creative Assembly's inspiration came from. There's a lot of media surrounding Troy in the form of books and films and other stuff, and I think that Total War Troy is just one interpretation of all of that material. It was fun, but I'll probably never play it again. I'm looking forward to moving on to a much, much better made game next. Anyway, I'm signing off here, but I just want to give a special thanks to my friend James, aka Repellent Zeus, who has endured me talking about ancient Greek lore and rambling about my video ideas for way too long now. I will leave some links to the resources that I have used to learn about this stuff, as it's all pretty accessible. No, Homer's Odyssey, I'm not talking about you. Also, I will link the Radius mod that I used. It's available on both Epic Games and Steam. A Total War Saga Troy. Not exactly the game we wanted, but my only alternative was Age of Mythology, which I love, but isn't exactly reliably grounded in history. Back already. You've returned. Good to see you, lad. Despite the circumstances. Remember your training out there. The pain of death is but another obstacle. Fear is for the weak. Take care, Achilles.